The Rise of Joseph Stalin After Nicholas II and his family were killed, civil war broke out in Russia. Russians loyal to the Tsar formed an army called the White Army to avenge the Tsar's death. In return, the communists organized their own army, the Red Army. For three years, civil war raged between the White Army and the Red Army. By 1922, the Red Army had won. A million and a half Russians who had supported the Tsar and the White Army, called White Russians, were forced to leave their country. Those who didn't leave were arrested, jailed, or executed. Now Russia was a totalitarian state, a country with only, only one political party. Most countries have at least two political parties. The United States has Republicans and Democrats. In a country with more than one political party, the two parties argue with each other about how the country should be run. Usually, the two sides have very different ideas. The people of the country listen to the arguments and decide which side has a better chance of making the country work. This way, all of the candidates get a chance to air their ideas. Perhaps the arguments even change some people's minds. But in a totalitarian state, no one gets to disagree with the one political party that runs the country. Lenin and the Communist Party exiled, jailed, or exited the Russians who disagreed with the Communist takeover, or who wanted Russia ruled in some other way. Lenin didn't get to govern his totalitarian state for, for very long. Almost as soon as the war between White Russians and Red Russians was over, Lenin had a stroke, an illness that caused his brain to stop working properly. He remained leader for two more years, but during those two years, the real leader of Russia was Joseph Stalin. When he was born, Joseph Stalin's name was Yosef Jugoskvili. He changed his name to Stalin when he joined the Communist Party at the age of 24. Stalin came from the Russian word for steel. Joseph Stalin, the steel ruler of Russia, was as hard as metal and as cruel as a steel sword. When Lenin died, Joseph Stalin became Russia's undisputed leader. He ordered the city of Petrograd, once St. Petersburg, to be renamed Leningrad in honor of Lenin. Stalin also ordered Lenin's body put in a glass coffin so that Russians could come and look at him. Scientists took out Lenin's brain so that they could study it to find out why he was such a political genius. Then other scientists soaked the body in chemicals to preserve it. Today, Lenin's body is still in its glass coffin in the Moscow town square known as Red Square. Anyone who visits the square can see it. A 15-member committee has taken care of the body for the last 80 years. Every week, they check the body to make sure that it isn't beginning to disintegrate and put more chemicals on it. Every once in a while, they change Lenin's clothes. Under Joseph Stalin, two things happened to communist Russia. The first was that Russia became the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. Threatening war if they didn't join, Joseph Stalin told the countries that lay just at the western border of Russia, between Russia and Poland, that they had to become part of a new communist empire. Over the next 20 years, the USSR, or Soviet Union, would spread eastward and swallow five little countries in the center of Asia. It would also reach over to the Baltic and gulp up Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, countries that had been given their freedom after World War I by the Peace of Versailles. That freedom didn't last for long. The second thing that happened during the rule of Joseph Stalin is that millions of Russians died. Many were executed by Stalin, and many more starved to death. Stalin had his own ideas about how Russia should become great. Most of Russia was farmland, where peasants grew crops. But Stalin wanted Russia to have factories and mines like the wealthy Western nations. He wanted steelworks that would make new rails for railroads that would go across Russia, and parts for electrical generators that would light up Russia's homes and streets. He ordered these new industries built, many of them in the icy wasteland of Siberia. And then he forced thousands and thousands of Russians to work in these factories, steelworks, and mines. If they didn't produce a certain amount of metal and goods, they were punished. He also ordered the peasants who still worked on farms to produce more food by working harder and planting more. They had to join together into huge collective farms, where hundreds of farmers worked on the same field. 
almost all of the food grown in these fields went into a common stockpile. In other words, most of it went to the government. The communist government was supposed to then hand it back out evenly to the people of Russia. Peasants and farmers of Russia hated these new arrangements. Many didn't want to leave their land and work in factories. Those who were still allowed to work on their farms now couldn't own their own fields or decide how to care for their own crops. And after all that hard work, they had to turn most of the food over to the government. The new collectives were so unpopular that many farmers simply refused to work on them. But Stalin knew how to deal with disobedient Soviet citizens. Anyone who resisted Stalin was arrested and shot or sent to work camps. The work camps, scattered all through Siberia and far to the east, were freezing cold. The prisoners who lived there labored for days or weeks or months with very little to eat. These labor camps, scattered through the open wasteland of Siberia, were nicknamed the Gulag Archipelago because they were spread out and isolated just like a string of islands. Most people sent to the Gulag died there. Then a drought spread across Russia. Crops began to wither. The harvests grew poorer and poorer. The peasants grew hungry. But instead of offering help, Stalin ordered them to keep on sending the same amount of grain to Leningrad. The peasants began to die of hunger. In the end, six million Russians starved during the famine. Joseph Stalin didn't care. He was determined to make Russia powerful. If people died, that was just part of the process. Anyone who muttered about Stalin's methods or his cruelty could expect to be shot or sent to Siberia. Stalin became infamous for his purges. To purify Russia of dissent, Stalin ordered his critics, called dissidents, to be arrested and sent to the Gulag. During Stalin's power, Fifteen million Russians went to the Gulag. Almost nine million were arrested and shot. One of the most famous Russian dissidents, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, spent eleven years imprisoned by the Soviets, many of those in a labor camp in the Gulag. He wrote that Russians could expect to be arrested at any time of the day or night by Russian police in disguise. Often the prisoners weren't even told what their crime was. They take you aside in the factory corridor after you have had your pass checked and you're arrested, he wrote. You are arrested by a religious pilgrim whom you have put up for the night for the sake of Christ. You are arrested by a meter man who has come to read your electric meter. You are arrested by a bicyclist who has run into you on the street, by a railway conductor, a taxi driver, a savings bank teller. Once arrested, you could expect to be sent to a camp without trial or a chance to clear your name. Solzhenitsyn wrote that revolution can never get rid of the evil inside human beings. It can only get rid of particular governments. Even when the evil of those governments is destroyed, the evil inside human beings remains. Solzhenitsyn was right. The communist government had been formed to get rid of tyranny. But Joseph Stalin, the leader of communist Russia, was as cruel, as tyrannical, and as evil as any Russian czar had ever been.